So this is a nano SIM card, and it's likely that many of you have this in your phone as we speak. But the topic of today's video is eSIMs, and I can't show you that because it's embedded on your phone's motherboard. So I just started using an eSIM, so I might not be aware of all the caveats that come along with it. If you want to skip ahead to the actual installation procedure, I'll have that timestamp down below in the play bar. But before we begin, I want to start with some pros and cons. So for the pros, an eSIM turns your phone into a dual SIM device without actually needing a second physical SIM slot. The phone I'm currently using is a Google Pixel 6 running Graphene OS, and it only has a single physical SIM slot, but internally it has an eSIM. So when your phone supports eSIMs, it means that you can download the eSIM to your phone and have both carriers, one from the physical SIM and one from the eSIM, connected at the same time. It's worth noting that while you can have multiple eSIMs downloaded to your device, only one of them can be active at a time. Another pro is that activation is quick. You don't need to wait for the physical SIM to come in the mail, you just download the eSIM and you are connected. The last pro is that if you ever used a VoIP number in the past or signed up for a service that offers VoIP numbers, you might have noticed that when you try to use that number with some companies, they actually block you from using it. eSIMs run on the same global system for mobile communications network as a physical SIM, which means you shouldn't have the typical issues you might encounter with a VoIP number. So since the eSIM is embedded in your phone, that means you can't just pop it out and put it in a different device. So while the initial setup is quicker, that means that migrating to a new device will be a bit more time consuming. I also learned that if you delete the eSIM, you can't easily re-add it. You actually need to reach out to the provider to have them give you the ability to reprovision it on your phone. And while it was a bit inconvenient, it did add a small additional layer of security that you need to reach out to the actual provider for this step. Of course, this step could be unique to the provider that I tested out, which was US Mobile, who I am not endorsing. They just happen to be the most affordable. And while it's not a pro or con, I don't think that an eSIM actually adds any additional privacy. I personally don't think there's much you can do when it comes to your mobile provider and privacy. It's an old archaic system like email that was never designed with privacy in mind. There's some sites that claim to offer anonymous SIM cards, but the fact is that the provider needs to receive your IMEI, which is a hardware ID burned into your device that can't be changed in order for the service to work. There are some things you could do, like buying a prepaid SIM card in cash to increase your privacy marginally. So even if you do manage to anonymously obtain a SIM card, the second you start making any sort of unencrypted phone call or sending SMS text messages, the providers will have records of who you're contacting and the numbers that you are communicating with. And I haven't looked into mobile service providers a ton yet, but that's my understanding so far. And then one last thing before the demo, I plan on sending out a somewhat weekly newsletter. So if you're brave enough to voluntarily read my writing, you can sign up on my website, sideofburritos.com. The plan is to include random tech stuff that I find along with non-tech stuff that I find interesting. And for those of you that have been signed up for months and received nothing, thank you for your patience. So as I mentioned, I will be demonstrating how to set this up on the OS that I'm currently using on my Pixel 6, which is Graphene OS. So there's a few things we need to do on the OS itself before we can actually add an eSIM. So it's worth noting that before you decide to use an eSIM, you need to be aware that it does require proprietary Google functionality to work, which means that in order to add the eSIM, you actually need to install Sandbox Google Play services on your owner profile. You can remove them after you have added the eSIM, but they are needed in order to add it initially. So if we go into settings and then network and internet, we can see here that enable privileged eSIM management is grayed out and we can't enable it. That's because Sandbox Play services are not currently installed. So once we install those, specifically Google Services Framework and Google Play Services. And now once that's installed, if we go back to settings, network and internet, we can now see enable privileged eSIM management is available. We can enable that. And at this point, we have the option to add an eSIM. So at this point, this is where Google comes in. We're actually going to be downloading an eSIM. So we click download an eSIM next. So this step we're going to skip for now. That'll come in a bit later. But if we now go to about phone and we scroll down, we can see IMEI SIM slot one. That's our physical SIM. And then IMEI SIM slot 2, that is our eSIM. So now that you have that second IMEI available, you can choose a provider of your choice. And like I said, I went with US Mobile. They were affordable. Their setup process was pretty quick. So once you actually go through, sign up with a provider, we can then go back to the eSIM section. Click the plus again. We're going to go through the same thing. Download SIM. 
nothing's going to change. We just want to get back to the QR prompt again. And now that we have the QR code scanner, scan the code in our screen. One USM number is available for this device. Download. And so when I initially signed up for the service on US Mobile, I put in my IMEI. Now I scan their QR code to actually provision it and download it to my device. It performed the lookup with their service, found my IMEI and the number that I was assigned, and is now downloading that to my phone. Download finished. Let's go into settings. We have the downloaded eSIM. Going to enable it. Turn it on. So with this eSIM, all I did was sign up for text messages because I needed a second number that could receive texts. So I'm actually going to be using it for mobile data, so no thank you. And so I would suggest renaming the SIM to whatever provider you signed up for. You'll see why in a moment while this is useful. Save. We can first see the physical SIM card up top, which is under SIM, and then we see the eSIM, which is under downloaded SIM. And now from here, you can manage each of these individually. This is where we changed the settings earlier for the eSIM. Here's the physical SIM. And so now that we have the eSIM fully set up, we can go ahead and actually remove those Google Play services. So now that we have those removed, everything will work as expected since we already downloaded the eSIM. You will notice that Enable Privileged eSIM Management was disabled because the Sandbox Play services are no longer installed. So if you do want to remove the eSIM or add a new one, you will have to reinstall those Sandbox Play services, but at this point you no longer need them installed. And so the reason the SIM card naming is important is that if we go into our call log, we can now see what SIM card was used to actually make the call. So if we look here, I haven't used the other SIM card to make any phone calls, so all these are labeled visible, which is what my primary SIM card is called. And if I made phone calls using the other one, it would be labeled US Mobile. And like I said earlier, this is my first time using an eSIM and also a dual SIM setup on a phone. So if I find anything interesting, I'll cover it in a future video. And the other cool thing to note is that in the top right hand corner now we can see there are two icons related to cellular connectivity. Since we have a dual SIM setup now, each SIM is connected to a provider and therefore we have two different connections.